The Big Story. Hey, mister. Yeah? How do we get on the road to Racine? Uh, keep straight on this road for about a half mile. There's a stoplight there. Take the right-hand turn. That'll bring you right onto the turnpike. Sounds kind of complicated, doesn't it, boys? Yeah, it sure yeah, does. Why, no, it's very simple. Well, we think it's complicated. Suppose you get in the car and show us the way, Vaughn. Oh, wait a minute. How do you know my name? Get in the car. Now, look here. Get in the car, Vaughn. Come on, get in before I blow your head off. The Big Story. The story you're about to hear actually happened. It happened in Elkhorn, Wisconsin. It's authentic and is offered as a tribute to the men and women of the great American newspapers. From the front pages of the Elkhorn Independent, the story of a cub reporter who used a fish story to make the biggest catch of his career in the world of crime. Elkhorn, Wisconsin. The story as it actually happened. Don Morrissey's story as he lived it. You're just a kid, Don Morrissey. But you've got a dream. And that dream is to be a newspaper reporter. Elkhorn is your hometown... But it so happens that you're a junior studying journalism at Marquette University. At the beginning of this particular summer, you're doing part-time work as correspondent for the UP and AP in your hometown. But you've got your eye on the future, Don Morrissey. And one day in late June, you walk up to the editor of the Elkhorn Independent, a weekly. Uh, Mr. Merritt? I wonder if I could talk to you for just a minute. Uh, make it just a minute, Don. Got a paper to get out here. We go to press tomorrow. Yes, sir, I know. What's on your mind? Well, Mr. Merritt, the fact is, I, I graduate from Marquette next year, and I thought maybe you'd be interested Why in... don't you come right out and say it, son? You want a job with the Independent next year. Uh, yes, sir. I'm working part-time for the AP and UP right now, but if you could take me on full-time next year, why, I'd sure appreciate it. Oh, you want to be a full-time reporter, do you? Yes, sir. That's all I've ever thought of. That's why I'm going to the School of Journalism oh, now. Oh, School of Journalism. All they teach you is how to t- type neat copy. Dot your eyes, cross your T's. I never heard of them showing any boy how to get a good story. You want a job with us, Don? You'll have to prove yourself. Yes, sir, but how? How? How does any young fella prove his ability? Goes out and finds a story, that's how. Not just a little brush fire or a church social. A good story. You understand? Yes, sir. I guess I do. Well, I'll, I'll keep my eyes open, Mr. Merrick. You do that, son, do that. And oh, uh, shut the door on your way out, will you? He gives you the brush off, and it smarts a little. But you've got your eye on that job, Don Morrissey. And you figure if there's ever a decent story to come out of a quiet little place like Elkhorn, it'll come out of the police station. So you go down to talk to Sheriff Oliver Clayson, tell him what you're after. Son... Let me ask you something. Yes, Sheriff? You're supposed to file copy out of Elkhorn for the Associated Press and the United Press. Is that right? That's right. All right. How much have you filed? Well, nothing, sir. Nothing's happened. That's it, Don. That's your answer. People here are decent law-abiding. Oh, we have an occasional drunk, burglary once in a while. Want my advice? (laughs) I sure do. Get out of Elkhorn after you graduate. Go to a big town. For instance, look at this. This morning's Milwaukee Journal. Yeah. Look at those headlines. Hmm? Edward Vaughn, missing. Wealthy Milwaukee brewer kidnapped by armed thugs. First ransom note received last night. See what it means, son? Okay, Mike... I'm in for five bucks more. I'll see you, Sam. Yeah, I'll raise you both. Cost you ten. Well, I'm in. Me too. What do you got, Leo? Full house. Queens high. How do you like that? Me with a lousy straight. Me with three bullets. <laughs> Better luck next time, suckers. Next time? Are you kidding, Leo? 
Yeah, you run me and Sam now for a couple of hundred. Ah, oh, you cheap punks. What are you whining about? Crying your crummy heads off for nickels and dimes when we're sitting back waiting for a hundred grand? Yeah, waiting is good. We've had Vaughn stashed away and it's broken down hide out for a week and still no pay off. Takes a little time to negotiate. It's taking too long. Either of you two think you can do it better? Now, look, Leo, we didn't mean nothing. We was only thinking... You're not supposed to think. I'll do the thinking around here. We'll spring Vaughn when his contact agrees to pay off. And until he does, you two crumb bums are going to sit on your lard bottoms and wait. You understand? Yeah, yeah, sure, Leo. You're the boss. Only we was just wondering when you're going to make contact again, Leo. Well, I figure they must be getting ripe about now. I'm putting in a phone call tonight. <laughs> Look, we're tired of waiting. Either we get a hundred grand tonight or you don't get your boy, you understand? That's better. Now, we want it in fifties and hundreds. That's right, fifties and hundreds. Unmarked bills and no cops around on delivery. Just keep your mouth shut and your ears open. I'm going to tell you how we want it. Hey, Leo. Yes, Sam? You think we're cool by this time? Yeah, we should be. We've laid lower months since they paid off. Brother, I can't wait till we get to Miami. <laughs> Miami. Boy, am I nuts about Miami. Hey, Leo, what town is this? A sign says Elkhorn, Wisconsin. Elkhorn. You can have it. <laughs> These towns. They all look the same and they all sound the same. <laughs> Elkhorn. Step on it, will you, Sam? What do you want, egg in your beer? This is the main drag. I'm doing 60 now. Yeah, and there's a curve up ahead. You better slow her down, Sam. Don't want any of these jerkwater cops to catch. Slow her down. Watch the road, you crazy fool. Look out for that telephone pole. Look out! Sheriff Clayson. Sheriff, Don Marcy. Oh, yeah, Don. I was just driving down Main Street when I saw a big car smacking into a telephone pole. Knocked the pole half over and kept right on going. Where did this happen? At the curb in front of Bethel Church. What kind of car did you notice? Well, it looked like a Chrysler Imperial. Must have been going 60 at least. 60, huh? The speed limit's 30. Yeah, and not only that, the telephone pole's ruined. Phone company's going to be plenty sore when they find out about it, Sheriff. All right, Don, thanks. I'll alert the highway patrol right away. <laughs> Hey, Leo. Yeah, Mike? Take a look through the back window. There's a motorcycle cop on our tail. Yeah, you're right. Someone must have seen us crack that pole. I better pull away from him. You're nuts, Sam. Slow her down. But, boss... I said slow her down. Now stop the car. We don't want to talk to any cops, Leo. Not right now. Put away that gun, stupid. I'll handle this. But how? Leo, I don't like it. What are you worrying about? A small town cop? These local characters don't even know the time of day. Now slow her down, Sam. Yeah, but... But nothing. Put away those guns and act dumb. That shouldn't be too hard for either of you. Let me do the talk and we'll be out of this burg in an hour. You, Don Morrissey, stop in at headquarters shortly after the three men are brought in. One of them, a man who says his name is Joe Winters, seems to be their spokesman when the sheriff asks him... Where'd you think you were going, mister? To a fire? I'm sorry, sheriff. We were anxious to get to the lake and get set up for some fishing in the morning. At Lake Geneva, huh? That's right. My friends and I came down from Milwaukee for the weekend. <laughs> you know how it is. You get three fishermen together and it's only a weekend. Well, you want to get in all you can. That's why we were going so fast. Mr. Winters, that's no excuse. We got speed laws in this town. 30 miles an hour. You were going 60. That'll cost you $25 or 10 days. Sheriff, as I said, I'm the first to admit we were wrong. And we'll be glad to pay the fine. That right, fellas? Absolutely. Sure, Joe. Yeah, Sheriff. Twenty-five dollars. All right, boys, let's go. Just one minute, Mr. Winters. Yes? I ought to jail the whole bunch of you for driving in a manner to endanger the lives of the public. But seeing as it was so late at night, I guess there wasn't any danger to anybody but yourselves. However, there's a little matter of damage to that telephone pole. You ought to see the front of our car. That's your business, but that telephone pole is our business. Well, we'll be glad to pay for any damages, Sheriff. How much do you figure it'll cost? Can't tell yet. Well, uh, 
Suppose you name a price. Can't tell until we get a man from the telephone company over here. How long will that be, Sheriff? Mm, might be an hour. Might take till tomorrow morning. You mean we may have to hang around here all night? Can't let you go till I find out the exact amount of the damage. Look, Sheriff, we said we'd pay. Uh, both of you just shut up, huh? Yeah, shut but... up, will you? The sheriff says we have to stick around. Why, we have to stick around. After all, we want to do the fair thing, and you wouldn't want us to break the law, would you? There's something about these three men, Don Morrissey. Something about them that makes you suspicious. The way they talk and act. And now, as the three strangers wait in the deputy's office, you try to tell Sheriff Clayson. Sheriff, there's something funny about these three men. What do you mean, Don? Oh, I don't know. I, I can't explain it exactly, but the way they act, their clothes. What's the matter with them? Well, that's just it. They're all dressed up as though they were going to some fancy summer resort. They look like fishermen to me. Now, look, Don. Their car is right out front. You take a look in the back. You'll see it's loaded with fishing equipment. Yeah? I still don't believe it. I'll bet they don't even have fishing licenses. You're wrong, son. I am? Hmm? The minute they came in, I asked for their papers. Each of them had a fishing license. All in order. Each of them had uh, identification papers. They were all in order, too. Oh, Let's see. Now, why don't you forget it and let me take care of this, huh? I call the phone company. They'll have a man over here in a few hours. The rest is just routine. You mean after they pay the damages, you let them go? Well, naturally. What else can I hold them for on what charge? Just, I don't know. <laughs> Neither do I. Now, look, son. I know what's in your mind. You do? Sure. You're looking for a story where there isn't any. You're... Uh, pressing too hard, Don. Take my advice. Go home and get some sleep. Well, why kid yourself, Don Morrissey? Sheriff Clayson is right. You want a story so bad it's running out of your ears. But somehow you can't get yourself to go home. Not quite yet. And about an hour later, you're still in the sheriff's office when... Come in. Oh, Mr. Winters. Uh, Sheriff, what about that man from the phone company? Any idea when he'll get here? He told me in a couple of hours, but it may take longer. The man's got to go down and take a look at the pool, Mr. Winters. Then he's got to report back to the company. After that, he'll probably get here with a statement on the costs and damages. I see. Sheriff, uh, tell you the truth, my friends and myself are getting a little fidgety just waiting around here. I'd like to settle this little thing just among ourselves. Mm. How do you mean? Well, we're anxious to get up to the lake and bait our hooks, and we figure if we have to pay a little more than the pole's worth, why, we just as soon do it. Will you take $100 for that pole and give it to the phone man when he gets here? Can't. Why not? You'll have to pay the exact amount. It's not legal otherwise. Look, Sheriff, if it comes to less than that, you can do what you want with the extra money. Give it to the policeman's benefit if you like. Sorry, can't do it. We'll make it 300 Sorry, Mr. Winters. 500 all right, we'll go to 750 if we have to. Now, be reasonable, Sheriff. That ought to buy two or three telephone poles. I told you for the last time, Mr. Winters, I can't do it. And if you're suggesting this is some kind of bribe, I'll show you some real trouble. I'll have to wait till the phone man gets here and that settles it. You understand? All right, Sheriff. That's it, that's it. Guess we'll just have to wait. Sheriff. Yeah? Why should they offer to pay all that money just for a damaged telephone pole? Now, you heard him. They want to get on with their fishing. Yeah, but they want as high as $750. Son, you don't know fishermen. When they get a smell of their favorite game, money's no object. Not only that, these fellows seem well healed. <laughs> to a lot of people in this world, that kind of money doesn't mean a thing. Sheriff Clayson passes it off. But not you, Don Morrissey. You figure these strangers are just anxious to get going for other reasons of their own. You try a shot in the dark. You go into the deputy's office where the men are waiting. Introduce yourself. 
So you're the local news hound here about, huh? That's right. Glad to know you, Morrissey. Hey, kid. Yeah? What's the matter with the sheriff? He out of his mind or something? We offer him seven and a half for that lousy telephone pole, and he turns us down. Why? <laughs> well, that's the way he is. Well, he's a lame brain if I ever saw one. Joe, maybe you should have told him we'd pay in cash. Maybe he figured you'd try to palm off a rubber check on him. Why don't you keep your mouth shut? Well, I was only Button saying... Button it up and keep it button, will you? You have to excuse my friends, Morrissey. They got one-track minds. They think you can buy anything with money. I don't know why I took them fishing with me. I should have left them home. Well, you'll enjoy the fishing in Lake Geneva, Mr. Winters. Yeah, I hope we will. I hear it's pretty good. Yeah, they're catching a lot of bluefish this summer. Fine. I haven't got myself a good bluefish in two years. If we get a few this time, I'll figure the weekend was worth it. Sure, Mr. Winters, sure. Well, I wish you luck. Sheriff Clayson, these men are phonies. What do you mean, phonies? They weren't going fishing. They don't know a thing about the sport. I just talk to them. It seems that they hope to catch a couple of bluefish down in Lake Geneva. Only there's one thing wrong with that picture. Bluefish is a saltwater fish. Why, they could fish Lake Geneva for a hundred years and never hook one. All right, son, but I see no reason to get head up about it. They could be amateurs. Their fishing equipment is brand new. <laughs> Maybe they don't know a bluefish from a smallmouth bass. You take Wisconsin this time of year, it's crawling with amateur sportsmen. Yeah, but, Sheriff, I'm trying to tell you... Look, the... Don, I told you. Don't go looking for a story where there isn't any. Come in. Say, uh, Sheriff, my friends and I are getting a little hungry. Any place we can get a bite around here? Well, there's a diner just across the street. Do you mind if we step across the street and get a hamburger? Well, one of you will have to stay, <laughs> just for insurance. The other two can go. Thanks, Sheriff. I'll send my two friends and stay here by myself. Andy, Bill. Yeah, what is it? The sheriff says it's okay for two of us to go, so you two go ahead and bring me back a couple of hamburgers. Rare. Mike. Leo's taking a big chance trying to bluff us out of trouble like that. Yeah, but he's getting away with it. So far. What do you mean, so far? He's outfoxed the sheriff, but that kid Morrissey, I'm not so sure. You think he's wise to us, Sam? I don't know. The way he keeps looking at us, I don't know. Like he figures we're phonies, you know what I mean? Yeah. But Leo's smart, Sam. And like I said, he's got by with it so far. Yeah, sure, sure he has. But how do you know what's going to happen until this telephone man gets there? How do you know some joker won't come in, some state trooper off the road and spot us? You never can tell. It could happen. And do you know what that'd mean? A hundred years and stuff. Yeah, maybe two hundred. And I don't feel like running the risk. Sam, I don't get you. You want me to write you a letter or something? Uh, you mean take off? Blow? Why not? We got our cut of the dough on us, haven't we? Yeah, but if we blow, we leave Leo holding the bag. I'm crying in my beer. Leo had to do it his way, okay? Let him sweat it out. But how are we going to get out of this tank, Tom? They got trucks coming through here all night. We could stand on the corner and thumb a ride. Well, you with me, or ain't you? Okay, Sam. I'm with you. Let's get out of here. You, Don Morrissey, grow fidgety after a while. The other two men seem to take a long time about getting themselves a bite to eat. You decide to take a look in the diner. They're gone. On your way back to the station, you stop and look over their car. <laughs> Nothing but fishing equipment here. The well, compartment's locked. Well, I just move this seat cushion. What? Oh, brother, wait till the sheriff sees these. Take a look, sheriff. Found these two guns under the front seat, 38 caliber. Some fishermen. And the two men took off? Yeah. The waitress told me they left a half hour ago. Well, son, I guess they had me fooled. Maybe I should have listened to you in the first place. Hm. I'll send out an alarm to highway patrol, and then we'll talk with this man, Winters, whoever he is. All right, Winters. For the last time, are you going to talk? Why did your friends run away? I don't know. What about these two guns this young fellow found in your car? Look, I got nothing to say. All right. In that case, I'll have to lock you up and book you on suspicion. You watch the man's eyes shift. You know that already he's planning some way to break out of the building. And somehow you, Don Morrissey, 
I'm more than ever convinced that this is big game, really big game. You get on the phone, call the FBI in Milwaukee. Talk to John Welch. Give me that again, Marcy. Well, the leader's a big man. Dark, wild black hair, thick lips, small scar, left side of mouth. The second one's small, blonde, watery blue eyes. What? The third, partly bald, reddish hair, a lumpy right ear. Why, yeah, Mr. Welch, that's right. Morrissey, you know what you've done? What? You just put your finger on the Duran gang. Leo Duran, Sam Falco, and Mike Reno. Wanted all over the country in connection with the Vaughn kidnapping in Milwaukee. As well as several others. Holy smoke! Tell the sheriff to triple his guard, Morrissey. That's Durant he's holding right now. I'll get to Elkhorn as soon as I can. <laughs> The FBI sets in motion a four-state alarm for the two escaped men. Meanwhile, the agent, John Welch, comes up and identifies Leo Durand. And a short time later, in the sheriff's office... Welch speaking. Oh, yes, here's... What? Where? Good. Bring him back here and we'll take him on back to Milwaukee. Good news, Mr. Welch? Couldn't be better... They just picked up Sam Falco and Mike Reno in a gin mill near Lake Geneva. And that's it, Don Morrissey. Except for one thing. On the same day, Mr. Merritt, the editor of the Elkhorn Independent, calls you in. Don, I'm proud of you. You certainly put Elkhorn on the map. Well, thank you, Mr. Merritt. Yes, sir. Got reporters from all the big papers in the Middle West in town right now. All those fellas from the big papers trying to find the Duran gang, and we find them right here in Elkhorn. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I guess we were pretty lucky, Mr. Merritt. Now, uh, about that job, I'll be going back to college in a couple of days, but I figure that maybe next year Next I'd... year? Son, if you want it, the job is yours right now. <laughs> Now we read you that telegram from Don Morrissey of the Elkhorn, Wisconsin, Independent. During trial, one of the kidnappers hung himself in his cell. The government failed to convict the other two on the kidnapping referred to, but convicted them on a previous kidnapping and successfully brought them to subsequent trial. They were both sentenced to 99 years at Joliet. And so ends another big story. In order to protect the names of people actually involved in tonight's authentic big story, the names of all characters in the dramatization were changed with the exception of the newspaper reporter. Big Story has been a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.